morning and thank you for joining me on the path to liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the 10th Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, April 11th, 2022. I hope you had a great weekend and I appreciate you joining me to kick off the week. On this episode, I'm talking about the word void. That's how many leading founders and old revolutionaries described acts that are outside the limits of the Constitution and living under the largest government in the history of the world today. We could probably describe almost everything they do as void, but they'll never be void in practice and effect, which is where we want them to be just by saying so. It's going to take people who understand their rights, understand that these things are void, whether the government tells us to or not, and people who are willing to defend them. I've got some great insight for this episode on this from James Otis Jr., Thomas Paine, Roger Sherman, and even, you might be surprised to hear this from me if you watch the show regularly, uh, over and over, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat while we allow people another minute or so to get notifications to join us on the live stream this morning. Uh, hi to Tim Martin. Good to see you. Cheriton Farmer in Missouri. Philip Lavery or Lavery. I apologize either way if I got that wrong. Washington State. Sharon Patriot. Clay, Sharon, I think you're here in SoCal as well. Hi. Uh, Clay Kent, Justin Morrison, Dixie Strong, Jason Calhoun, Hunter SF770. Awesome. Good to see you on Twitch. We don't get a lot of people following us on Twitch, so that's pretty cool to see you there. We're going to keep streaming on all the different platforms that we're able to, including the decentralized, censorship-resistant odyssey.com. Hi to Dave Simmons and Eric and everyone else. I apologize if I miss anybody. I'll try to get to some questions and comments a little bit later on the show, or I will read them later on today and reply to as many as I can. But I want to start this out with the great legal mind of the time, St. George Tucker, who wrote a View of the Constitution of the United States, first published in 1803. Here's how he put it. If in a limited government, the public functionaries exceed the limits which the Constitution prescribes to their powers... Every such act is an act of usurpation in the government. Let's say that again. If you've got a limited government, a government of limited delegated powers, soon as they go beyond the limits which the Constitution gives to them, soon as they go beyond that, every act is an act of usurpation. And as such, he wrote, treason against the sovereignty of the people which is thus endeavored to be subverted and transferred to the usurpers. Now that may sound that may sound like it's got some impact, but it might be a little confusing. There's actually a lot to unpack there. We have to understand what they meant, what the founding generation, what people like St. George Tucker and others understood by some of these words. So let's use some of the dictionaries they used at the time. First of all, the word sovereign or sovereignty here, and you can find a bunch of different dictionaries that have very similar uh, similar definitions as this. This is Nathan Bailey's English Dictionary, I think of 1775. They all kind of look the same uh, to me over time. Here, sovereign. The word sovereign means absolute, chief, supreme, excellent in its kind. Sovereignty, the state or quality of a sovereign prince. Supreme power. That's the word sovereign or sovereignty. Then for the word usurpation or to usurp, we go to Nathan Bailey's English Dictionary. No, this is that was Nathan Bailey's. This is Thomas Sheridan's Complete Dictionary of the English Language in 1789, right around the time uh, of ratification. Uh, uh, and here's how he put usurpation. Forcible, unjust, illegal seizure or possession. So forcible, unjust, illegal seizure or possession. So what we're talking about when we're talking about a usurpation of sovereign power, if we're talking about sovereignty first, that means final authority. And if government has been delegated some powers by the final authority, if we're recognizing that in the American system, the people hold sovereignty, that's what all the founders agreed upon, and the government goes beyond the limits given to them, they are stealing stuff. They are doing an illegal, forcible seizure of that power that was never delegated to them. And that brings me back to something I've mentioned a bunch of times on this show that we've talked about a lot recently, and that's James Otis and his arguments against the writs of assistance in 1760, 1761, which John Adams repeatedly referred to over the years as what he called the beginning of the controversy between the American colonies and Great Britain. And in that speech, he said what you can see here on the screen 
an act against the Constitution is void. This really represented a huge shift in the political thought of the revolutionaries, of the American colonists, recognizing that government no longer held sovereignty in the American system. Government wasn't the final authority, because if government had the final say, like we allow it to have today, then government is the one who tells us if an act against our Constitution is void or not. But when the people are sovereign, the people hold final authority. It doesn't matter what government says. An act beyond the Constitution is void, but it's not just going to get there on its own. Anyways, we'll get to that in a little bit. Here, years later, Thomas Paine summed it up like this. He said, this is in Rights of Man, I think it's part two, all power exercised over a nation must have some beginning. It must either be delegated or assumed. So either it's delegated by a sovereign to someone to exercise to do stuff, or it's assumed, just taken. He said, there are no other sources, either delegated or assumed. All delegated power, Payne wrote, is trust. And all assumed power is usurpation, an illegal seizure of power to Tom Payne. And here's St. George Tucker again in 1803. He put it this way. Every extension of the administrative authority beyond its just constitutional limits is absolutely an act of usurpation. James Iredell, who is one of the first justices, associate justices of the Supreme Court, here he is in the North Carolina ratif ratification debates in the summer of 1788. He said any law not warranted by the Constitution is a barefaced usurpation. And they sure don't make Supreme Court chief justices like they used to either. I think Oliver Ellsworth was number three. He put it this way in January 1788 in the Connecticut ratifying convention. He was an ardent Federalist. He said, if they make a law which the Constitution does not authorize, it is void. And I think of all people making this particular point, we're going to get into some of the important kind of how this plays out in practice, what this means for us, rather than just a theoretical discussion. Of all the people who describe this, I think of all people, Alexander Hamilton summed it up best. And I'm not one who likes the flip-flopper monarchist, well... <laughs> I'm not going to get into the problems that I have with Hamilton, but when he's right, he's right. And he did a lot of really good writing in the lead up to ratification. Maybe he was just a shyster who was just telling the people what they wanted to hear. But here's how he described it for the public debate urging ratification. Federalist 48, June 14, 7. Oh, no, this is uh, yeah, June 14, 1788. He says there is no position which depends on clearer principles than that every act of a delegated authority contrary to the tenor of the commission under which it is exercised, is void. There is no position, he said, which is more clear than this. Soon as they go beyond those limits, that act is void. He said, no legislative act, therefore, contrary to the Constitution, can be valid. None. To deny this would be to affirm that the deputy is greater than his principal. Again, we're talking about all delegated power is trust and assumed power is a usurpation. That's the same thing that Payne is saying. This is the same type of a view. The, the power comes from somewhere. And to say that the people who have been deputized, in essence, who've been hired, who are working to exercise the powers that were delegated to them by the sovereign people of the several states can do more than what is authorized is saying that they are actually more powerful than the sovereign. This is absurd. To deny this, Hamilton said, would be to affirm that the deputy is greater than his principal, that the servant is above his master, that the representatives of the people are superior to the people themselves, that men acting by virtue of powers may do not only what their powers do not authorize, but what they forbid. And this is just insane because this is exactly how people treat things today. They basically say, well, the Supreme Court decided, so it's settled. No, they don't have final authority or sovereignty over the people of the several states. The people have to first recognize this and they have to do something about it. So this is not just this is not just a theoretical thing. And I think the answer of what this means for us today is probably one of the most important when it comes to the future 
of the Constitution and liberty. And nothing helps us get this kind of information out to more people every single day than the financial faith and support of our members. And you can join us for as little as two bucks a month. I just got to mention this quickly over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. We reach and teach more and more people every day, and I couldn't be more grateful for your support. And I do want to say a quick thank you to just a handful of people who have joined us as new members lately. Thank you so much goes out to Ashley in Florida, Jeffrey in Iowa, Fred in New York, Rob in Massachusetts, Donna in Alabama, Ryan in Michigan, and Lisa in Washington. I missed a bunch. I didn't get to include everybody, but I'm so grateful for y'all, all your support. Thank you so much. So anyways, we've got things. We're talking about sovereignty. Sovereignty is final authority. Usurpation is every act that goes beyond the limits of the Constitution. That's an illegal seizure of sovereign power. And then we have the word void, how we're supposed to look at acts of usurpation under the Constitution. And surprisingly enough, Alexander Hamilton, of all people, gives us some insight of what this means in practice. Rather than just talking about it, just calling something void, what does this mean? And here he is in Federalist number 33. He says, but it will not follow from this doctrine. And he's talking about the supremacy clause, the concern that the federal government would be supreme. But he's focusing heavily, and I'm not going to get too uh, distracted by this, but he's focusing heavily on federal acts are only supreme when they're in pursuance of the delegated powers of the Constitution. He says, but it will not follow from this doctrine that acts of the large society, which are not pursuant to its constitutional powers, but which are invasions of the residuary authorities of the smaller societies will become supreme law of the land. So he's like, OK, we have the supremacy clause, but it does not come from that, that when they go beyond those delegated powers, when they're not in pursuance of the Constitution, those are not supreme law of the land. He says these will be merely acts of usurpation and will deserve to be treated as such. So. A lot of us point out, oh, they shouldn't be doing this, they're not authorized to do that, etc. But we're missing the second half of that. We'll deserve to be treated as such. But some people still tell me, they'll still tell me that it's up to the federal courts and the federal courts alone to tell us when a federal act is void. It's up to the federal courts and the federal courts alone to tell us if there was an act of usurpation and to treat it that way. And that Hamilton even only meant the courts too. Now, maybe so, but maybe we can get to Alex in just a minute. But first, I want to get to James Iredell. Again, one of the first chief justice, one of the first Supreme Court justices. He was associate. I think he was number three or number four. He was nominated by George Washington. Again, they don't make them like they used to. He says, here he is in the North Carolina Ratifying Convention, July of 1788, describing it this way. If this Constitution be adopted, it must be presumed the instrument will be in the hands of every man in America to see whether authority be usurped. The point is, every single person has the ability to learn the delegated powers of the Constitution, including the Necessary and Proper Clause and general welfare, legal doctrines of principles and incidents. They can understand the Commerce Clause. They can learn this stuff. And it's in their hands. It's their responsibility, really, to learn and understand how it's supposed to be, not just how government tells us they want it to be. And it's in their hands of every single person in the country to determine whether or not authority is usurped. It's not only in the hands of the government itself to tell us the final authority. That's the wrong way to look at it. He said, and every person, again, James Iredell, every person by inspecting the Constitution may see if the power claimed be enumerated. If it be not, he will know it to be an, an usurpation, a usurpation. So everyone can look at the Constitution and determine whether or not the federal government is authorized to do this stuff and have their own opinion on this. It is not just the federal courts who tells us this. And in fact, he's not even saying he's not even claiming that just put just a quick aside. Iredell is not claiming that if you give a government limits on paper, here's the stuff you're authorized to do that somehow magically government is going to follow it. They expect government to try to go beyond the limits of any rules given to it. Otherwise, there's no reason for the average person 
to be able to look at the document and determine whether or not the Constitution, the powers were usurped. There's no point in that. They're expecting this to happen. And that's why they wanted everyday people to learn these legal principles and to be able to understand and read this. That's James Iredell. Here's George Nicholas in the Virginia Ratifying Convention with a very similar view. He says, if they, again, is this just for the courts to make this decision if something is void and should be resisted? Oh, hint of where we're going with this, right? If they exceed these powers, this is the Virginia Ratifying Convention, George Nicholas, June of 1788. If they exceed these powers, the judiciary will declare it void. Okay. If not, the people will have a right to declare it void. So if the judiciary does their job, if there's, if you can even get to the Supreme Court with all the laws and regulations they passed today, if you can even wait for that, which is, I think, I've covered in other episodes, the idea of actually, and Spooner talked about this in his great work in the 19th century, Lysander Spooner talked about if you have to obey an illegal unconstitutional act until the government tells you it's unconstitutional, that means an unconstitutional act has the same binding force in law as a constitutional one. And that's absurd. And he was really drawing on the founding tradition, the founders and old revolutionaries who talked about this same thing. It's not just to wait for government to tell us they screwed up because that doesn't happen. So you could wait for the judiciary to declare it void. And if they don't do it, he says the people still have the right to do it themselves. And that's why Roger Sherman in December of 1787, he had a very similar view. All acts of the Congress would not all acts of the Congress not warranted by the Constitution would be void. Again, that word void. Nor, but he's also recognizing that even though the Constitution is being violated, government just waving the document at government people isn't going to just get them to stop trying to enforce. He knows there could be some level of conflict over what is authorized or not. He said, nor could they be enforced contrary to the sense of a majority of the states. In other words, Government tries to do something in, in the, the federal or general government, as they call it at the time. They're going to do something. And then the people of the several states see it as beyond the limits of the Constitution. Government tries to enforce it anyways. Then, without the participating participation and sense of most of the states, they're not helping out. They're resisting in various ways, noncompliance, etc. They can't get it enforced, but they're going to try anyways. And he talks about, he says, when the government overleaps those bounds and interferes with the rights of the state governments, they will be powerful enough to check it. So if enough people and enough states resist a usurpation of power, according to Roger Sherman, they can make it void in principle and in practice and effect. And that's what, uh, again, Alexander Hamilton. Here we go. You're not going to ever hear me citing Alexander Hamilton this much, but there's a lot of good stuff here. Here, Federalist number 28, December of 1787, just a couple of weeks, three weeks, it looks like, just after Roger Sherman's letter of December 8th that I just cited. And here he is, the obstacles to usurpation. And he's talking about a, a larger uh, union of states at this point versus a smaller one. The obstacles to usurpation. So the obstacles to uh, stealing illegal seizure of power and the facilities of resistance, not voting the bums out or asking government to invalidate its own laws, the obstacles to usurpation and the facilities of resistance increase with the increased extent of the state, provided this, the citizens understand their rights and are disposed to defend them. So again, you need this one-two punch. You not only have to understand that your rights are being violated every time they exercise a power not delegated to them, even if it doesn't impact you personally, they're stealing power that isn't authorized to them. They're affecting other people. They're creating an, uh, a precedent. And maybe you don't want this power exercised in your state at all. So therefore, maybe the people of your state haven't even authorized your own state government to do something like this. So this is always an act of usurpation, always treason against the final authority of the people, as St. George Tucker. But people have to understand those limits of the Constitution. That's why we try to reach and teach people about the original legal meaning of the Constitution. But they also have to have a disposition to defend them. And that's how uh, the great Samuel Adams, the father of the American Revolution, put it in his letter of October 1771, I think it was October 14th, writing as Candidus in the Boston Gazette. He said, the truth is all might be free if they valued freedom 
and defended it as they ought. Now, if you want to find the source documents I mentioned in this episode, I'm talking about a lot of original speeches and ratification debates and articles and letters and Federalist papers and stuff like that. Make sure to follow us over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. If you're looking up on the screen, I'm kind of scrolling down that page. There's various sections uh, like a nullification, 10th Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. I've got a section on the Supreme Court, uh, various anti-federalist papers from Brutus, Cato, et cetera, surveillance, the police state. And I publish an individual episode, a blog post for each episode, about one to two hours after the live stream is done. So in the next couple hours, I'll have a blog post published. You'll be able to find all the different platforms we're on, both video, live streaming, and archive video. We archive the video as many platforms as possible, Gab, Rumble, uh, MeWe, BitChute, BitTube, BrightTion, everywhere we can think of possible or that I can at least work into the the day-to-day workflow. But we have the audio-only podcast edition too, which is actually reaching far more people than I ever expected. Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podbean, and the rest. Make sure to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you listen on audio, because that helps trigger the algorithm and tells them to show us to more people. And then all the links that I mentioned here, again, are in the show notes section of each blog. Again, it's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, and I will have a link to our membership program, as I mentioned there as well. Well, I really appreciate you joining me today. I hope you found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I want to take a look over in the live chat and see if there's any... um, questions or comments that I can get back to. Philip Lavery says, I'm reading Patrick Newman's book, Cronyism. Uh, Patrick is a really great writer. I got a chance to meet him at an event in Virginia. I have not a chance, not had a chance to read his book yet, uh, but I really like the work that he's done. Haji, 1954, says, Otis Payne and St. George Tucker did excellent work on usurpation. And it's fascinating, I think, especially those of you guys who know me and at least know the work that I do, to see so much of Hamilton's writings fitting, but in a weird way, maybe it does fit because I often call him a flip-flopper. He was a tenther in the days leading up to ratification, and then he changed his tune as soon as he wanted to get a central bank. Uh, Haji also says, James Otis Jr., what an inspirational uh, uh, inspirational hero. This audience, Erwin Havernick says, uh, understands usurpation. Hardly anyone else. Yeah, This is the type of thing that I don't think most people even think about. They just think if government were not allowed to do something that they're doing, well, surely there'd be a Supreme Court case on this. And if the Supreme Court makes a decision, our system tells us that the Supreme Court has final authority because the Supreme Court told us this in 1958. So the Supreme Court is the ultimate arbiter of all questions. Now, Thomas Jefferson, he wasn't alone told us that to think about a part of the federal government as being not only the final, but the ultimate and sole supreme authority on what the Constitution means is a dangerous doctrine, something that leads to an oligarchy, an oligarchy of nine unelected, unaccountable, politically connected lawyers. Really, you could say an oligarchy of five. If they're deter- telling us, the sovereign people, the people of the several states, what their constitution means, that means they really have final authority. And that's why I think it was important to point out what Hamilton had to say. It, you really have to have not only an understanding of your rights, an understanding of the powers of the constitution, but a disposition of the people to defend them when government goes beyond those limits. Again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, I hope you learned something here today. That's more important than anything. Make sure to smash the like button, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, any other podcast platform, and of course, our membership program over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Thanks again for being here, and I will see you next time on the path to liberty.